I have launched thousands of campaigns on TikTok and Facebook, and I've scaled countless winning products while also having a huge graveyard of losing products as well. And today I'm going to teach you all the lessons I've learned through my five plus years of media buying and testing products so that you know confidently when to kill or scale your next product test like a seasoned veteran. So we're going to get into what numbers actually matter versus the ones you really shouldn't pay attention to and set some baselines for those, along with teaching you how to test products the right way and how to actually analyze after they've launched the first couple of days, because the reality is it's super easy just to copy and paste someone's strategy but once things are spending and your emotions get involved because it's your own hard-earned money that's when people tend to go off the rails and they make very poor decisions so we're going to walk through some real life campaigns so you know exactly what to do and of course most importantly we're going to teach you how to scale once things are working now the first step to being an elite media buyer is you need to check your emotions at the door and let the numbers guide your decisions the best media buyers in the world are always the most cold calm collected borderline serial killer vibes where they don't have any empathy they don't have any emotions they just look at the numbers and then boom they make a decision they don't overreact they don't panic when numbers aren't going their way for a few hours or for a day or so they just look at the numbers overall and then that is what will guide their decisions so let's talk about what numbers you'll actually be using to guide those decisions now for me personally I believe these are all the numbers you really need to have. You're going to spend money on your ads. You are going to have CPM, which is the cost to show your ad to a thousand impressions. You will get some clicks. There will be a cost for each one of those clicks. There will be a click through rate. There will be people that land onto your product page. And then from there, a percentage of those will add to cart. And then a percentage of those will buy. This is really everything you need to know. Now, personally, I like to add two custom metrics, which aren't native to either Facebook or TikTok. So when you go into here, and again, every single column section is the exact same way. So you just click on columns, customize columns. So you'll have to create a custom metric in both. And you're going to do two metrics called hook rate and hold rate. Now, these are secondary metrics. These are not going to be the main things that guide your decision. I like to see them just to see my ad performance in general, in terms of getting people to watch my hook and getting people to complete my ad. So first off, hook rate, what does that actually mean? It is the percentage of people that watch your hook. So the numbers tend to be a little bit inflated because you're going to do two second video views divided by total video views so let's say you get a thousand total video views and 200 of those actually watch the first few seconds then that means your hook rate is 20 percent. now you may be wondering ethan what is a good baseline metric how many people should be watching my hook on tiktok because the number is only for two seconds i recommend that hook rate being around 40 to 50 percent I would say on Facebook, it's going to be closer to 30 to 40% because it's going to be three second video views, which does make a difference. That extra second really does. Every second counts, especially when you're in the bedroom. Now, two second video views, you're going to click this divided by symbol here, and then we're going to add the metric of total video views. So we're going to grab on that. So that's going to be our hook rate. And then from up here, you're going to have to scroll all the way up in your handy dandy column section, and you'll see your custom metrics. Now, the second thing that we're going to do is hold rate, which is going to be set up in a very, very similar way. So we're for format we're going to do percentage once my crappy cricket wireless lets me type. And then from here, we're gonna do video views at 100%, so people that actually completed the entire ad, and we're gonna divide that by two second video views on TikTok. And then on Facebook, again, this is gonna be three second video plays instead of the two seconds. So again, they're very interchangeable. They're the exact same metric, to be honest. Then we're gonna click on create metric like that, and then we're gonna add that as our last column. So confirm name it whatever you want for me i call it e-dog or the master kpi list totally up to you make it cool now one tiny itsy bitsy thing when it comes to facebook kpis is i don't do total link clicks i prefer unique instead which basically means let's say you have 25 people click on your website they're all unique individuals they are 25 individual people well if one of those people let's say click on your website once and then the next day they click on your website again then that will count as two link clicks instead of one so with unique link clicks it actually just counts every person that went onto your website versus oh one person clicked on your website five times so the numbers are a bit inflated because it says five link clicks instead of one so i prefer unique link clicks because it's a little bit more accurate now let's talk about some example benchmarks for every single kpi now the kpi that is going to guide all of your decision making when you're media buying should be your break even cpa everything else is completely secondary it does not matter if you have an ad group or an ad that is currently below your break even cpa so if i'm selling this water bottle for 30 dollars it cost me five dollars that means my break even cost for purchase is 25 because i don't lose any money and i don't make any money when i acquired that customer so if i have an ad group below 25 dollars a purchase so let's say 20 i'm profitable i'm golden that is great every other metric i could have a cost per click of three dollars i could have an ad to cart percentage that's terrible if i am profitable that is the only thing that matters so obviously that means your break-even cpa is going to depend on what you're currently selling your product for and how much it costs you now with all the secondary metrics there are some general rules that i tend to follow now for cpm 
on TikTok, I tend to want this number to be below $15. If it's above 20, that's when things are really concerning. And I may consider swapping out my ad account, swapping out my pixel, because just that ad account was a bit of a dud. And that does happen. Some ad accounts just naturally perform better than others. I don't know why. Unfortunately, that's just what happens when you've been doing this for years and you've tested on hundreds of different ad accounts. Now, other things, when it comes to your clicks and CPCs, this does not depend on your ad account or pixel. If you're not getting clicks, that just means you have bad ads. So I tend to aim for a cost per click of 75 cents or less on both TikTok and Facebook. And I would say on Facebook, when it comes to CPM, that's where it's a little bit different. Facebook will naturally have higher CPMs because there's more competition. More people are spending money to show their ad to the same audience that you want to show your ads to as well. So naturally, that means it's going to be more costly to show your ad. Now, because I forgot to say on Facebook, my CPM goals, I usually want to be below 30 to $35. Sometimes you will be above that if you're in a more competitive niche, because how it typically works with CPM is it's based on how large is your audience size. So the larger the audience, the broader it is, the cheaper it is to show your ads. But if a lot of people are competing for that audience, so if you're in skincare, fitness, very high demand niches where there are tons of advertisers spending a lot of money, then you're naturally gonna have higher CPMs because you have to bid more to show your ad. Now, when it comes to CTR, on a winning ad, I'm usually at 1.5%. But again, if I'm profitable, my CTR could be at 0.5%. I really do not care as long as I'm profitable, but that's my general guideline. And if you don't know what CTR is, it's basically, if you get 100 people that watch your ad and one ends up clicking to your website, that's a 1% CTR. So it's the amount of people that watch Watch your ad at any point. It doesn't mean that they completed the ad, but that actually clicked to your website out of all the impressions. Now, going to the next metric, landing page views. Now, I know it's glitching, but typically landing page views is a good metric to see how fast your website is. So let's say I got 4,000 clicks and out of those 3,000 made it to my landing page. That means 3,000 divided by 4,000, 75% of people that clicked my ad made it to my website, which is a huge drop off. That means 25% of the people that I am paying money to get clicks are not even seeing my website, which would imply that, again, you need to work on your speed score. And that's something that you can test using GT metrics and a few other website speed tools. So that's the only reason why I look at that. And then when it comes to add to carts, this is usually going to be a percentage based on, again, your break even CPA. I tend to really just want to be at around a five to 10% add to cart percentage, meaning if I get 100 clicks, I want around five to 10 of those to actually add to cart. So if you're in that range, that's pretty solid. And then really final things from here, CPA, where you talked about when it comes to ROAS, I'm going to be honest, I very rarely look at this anymore because it can be inflated for a variety of different reasons. I know a lot of people swear by this metric. The reason why I don't like it is I I believe the most consistent ad groups are the ones that can get you purchases below your break even. However, let's say you spend $100 on two different ad groups. One ad group gets you one purchase, the other ad group gets you three purchases. So you would say, okay, Ethan, well, the one that's got me three purchases is definitely the one I wanna scale. It's been more consistent, it got me more purchases. And I would agree with you. However, where ROAS can get tricky is let's say on that ad group that got the one purchase, someone ended up being a big baller, DJ Khaled, another one, they bought 10 of your product. So because they spent, let's say $1,000 and you spent $100 in the ad group, you have a 10 ROAS. Compared to on the one that got three purchases, let's say the person spent an average of $100. So you still have a three ROAS, but the ad group above it has a 10. So you would misconstrue and say, oh, then therefore that means the ad group that has the better ROAS is the one I should be scaling. When in reality, you probably got a lucky purchase and it's not as scalable as you think. All right, quick time out. I hope you're enjoying the video so far. Make sure to leave a like if you are, but if you do want to actually shortcut your learning curve when it comes to building your websites, testing products and scaling to one grand a day in the next 90 days, then I would recommend having a one-on-one -on -one coach that will actually look at your website every time you test the product and tell you what you should be improving on, how you can improve your ad creatives and also making sure that you choose a product that can scale because in a lot of cases, you don't want to waste your time months of time and thousands of dollars testing products that just never had a chance to work in the first place so if you're kind of lost and you haven't seen any results so far in your dropshipping journey then i would recommend applying down below to my one-on-one -on -one coaching program where you will get a coach that is dedicated to you that will answer all of your questions that will give you the support and give you the experience that you are going to need to leverage in order to see results as soon as possible and shortcut the learning curve and all the trial and error along with that you also get five group calls a week every single weekday to talk to me get your questions answered and learn what our other students that are scaling to 5, 10, 20 grand days even like my student Matt are doing to get to those levels. So if you're interested in applying for that program, click the link down in my description and book a call with my team and we'll see if you're a good fit to become our next case study. And then finally, hook rate and hold rate. We have great hook rate on this ad. 61% is solid. Anything again above 40%, I would say you are in the green. Hold rate, honestly, hold rate, I'd say 10 to 15% is solid. So 50%, this is kind of anomaly. I would not ever shoot for this. This is not really that sustainable. I know this is kind of a unicorn ad that I'm showing 
showing you here but typically if you're above 10 to 15 percent you are cooking with gas congratulations soldier you have passed the first test wow firm grip by the way and you now understand what numbers you need to look at when you're analyzing your campaigns and the next step from here is yes we do need to know how to test a product and I would say there are tons of different testing methods. Some people will swear by ABO, some will do CBO, smart advantage campaigns. There's so many different ways to do it. The reality is I believe the only thing that you should take away from testing strategies is you need to be testing a variety of creatives to find out which creative actually gets you the most profitable return. The audiences nowadays have become so less important compared to your creatives that I would say it used to be almost a 50 50 level of importance about five years ago. Today, I'd say your creatives are 95% of your success. And no matter if you're doing ABO, CBO, that is irrelevant. And honestly, your creatives will carry you despite what testing strategy you use. And a good testing strategy will not carry bad creatives. So that's where you should be putting the majority of your time and focus on the actual creatives that you test. So how should you go about testing a product? And let's say you have four unique creatives and let's say three variations of each. So I have a how to ad that has a few variations, a problem solution, three reasons why green screen. Now, how I do it on both platforms is I'm going to have a specific ad group for each style of concept that I'm testing. So let me show you an example campaign real quick. So right here, I was testing a shower head filter and I had four different concepts. So I had a problem solution ad, I had a bad water ad pressure test, and then another version of problem solution. So I had a specific ad group and in each ad group, I had all the ads pertaining to that specific concept. So all my problem solution ads that were the second script were in this ad group. All the bad water ads were in their own specific ad group. And the reason why I separate them out is so that I can properly see which creative is working the best for me instead of dumping all the in one ad group where sure you could break things down but i tend to like to isolate things per ad group and with each ad group you may be wondering is there any difference how did you actually set it up i just personally believe do broad because the bigger the audience the cheaper it will be to show your ad and the bigger your audience the more you're able to scale because if i have let's say 50 million people compared to 5 million if i do interest then sure maybe it'll work but that audience size is smaller. It's gonna cost me a premium. And I personally believe that when you do interest or when you narrow down your audience, you are charging a premium where you could be showing your ads for a $10 CPM, but when you add an interest, it's gonna be a $15 CPM or a $20 CPM. So you're getting charged double to show your ads to the same number of people. So as I scroll down, I'm gonna do the conversion event of purchase. I'm gonna make sure that's the pixel tied to my store. I don't do anything crazy when it comes to scheduling. I'm just gonna do midnight or 7 a.m. the next day. Again, really doesn't matter that much to me. So when we get inside this ad group, I'm gonna obviously optimize for purchases because that's the only thing that really matters. I do like to do dynamic creative. I do find that's the best way to split test different creatives that you have. Then scrolling on down when it comes to budgeting and schedule. So schedule, I usually do either midnight or 7 a.m. of the next day. I find that it really doesn't doesn't matter as much as you think because it's going to spend pretty much evenly throughout the day and then when we scroll on down locations i tend to do the big four i know this one says us but i tend to do us canada australia and uk and based on that obviously facebook or tiktok will spend your money and you can break down which locations are getting more spend and obviously you can look at your shopify to see where orders coming from so that you can spend more money on the countries that are getting the best return because it might not be the us which in most cases it is but it could be australia or uk where oh Oh, I see my campaign only spent $20 in the UK, but I got two purchases compared to I spent $100 in the US, but I only got one purchase. So you might want to look at those numbers, break it down, and then decide to spend more money in the UK in the future. Everything else, I do advantage plus audience. I do advantage plus placements because then again, I can show my ads to more people. And when I show my ads to more people, then that typically is going to result in more purchases. And then looking at this product, when I tested it over on TikTok, I did exactly the same thing. I had specific ad groups for each concept. And if we scroll on down, TikTok only, I'm doing US and Canada because I didn't have an agency account for this specific ad account because I had this TikTok credit that I wanted to redeem, which is a really, really good deal right now. And then when it comes to genders, I'm only going to specify this on either TikTok or Facebook if I know the product is specifically for one gender. So if it's for females, yes, do females. If it's for males, do males. It's really not going to affect the audience size as much as you think. For ages, I'm doing 18 plus. I want people to actually have credit cards and can spend some money. And then down here, same thing when it really comes to the scheduling. Now, I do like to day part on TikTok from 7 to 11. And that typically is what works best for me. Now, when it comes to bidding models, I do conversion, maximum delivery, all these little things. This is really all you need to do. I do lowest cost typically for also my bidding method. And again, 
creative wise i'm just going to drop the creatives that are specific towards that ad group but i'm really just keeping it broad and if you're wondering do i do cbo abo again i really don't think this matters but i do like to do 50 dollars a day as a cbo that way that my money only goes to the ad creatives that tiktok or facebook believes will get me my best return on my money compared to wasting money equally spreading it out among all the different creatives because the reality is you're going to have about 80 to 90 percent of your ad creatives fail so if I spread my money evenly, that means around 80 to 90% of my money is going to be wasted. But I'd rather only waste about 10 to 20% while it spreads my money to a few of the creatives, lets them get a little bit of spend. But once Facebook or TikTok identifies what creative is clearly working the best, yeah, I want it to automatically just spend the money and funnel it to the best performing creative so that I can have the best chance of succeeding. And usually the one objection people will say when you are doing CBO is, okay, obviously this ad creative got a ton of spend. We can see overall it got the majority of the spend, but this creative here only got a dollar. So did it really get a fair chance? Is it potentially a winner there, but it just didn't get the spend that it needed? Well, for me, I believe these algorithms that have an unimaginable amount of data points on us, they know every single little thing about you to the point where when you go to sleep, when you wake up, they know your dog's name. They know the exact roses that your girlfriend likes that I think it honestly is idiotic to think that you are going to outsmart the algorithm. The algorithm knows so much more about what works than us that that's why I don't toggle with interest or doing anything on the audience level. I'm just going to let TikTok, Facebook, lead the way do the heavy lifting and i'm just going to provide the creatives to them and whatever it feels like is going to work the most is most likely going to be the thing that works the most so if a creative doesn't get spend it is for good reason these algorithms have thousands and thousands of data points they have ran millions of campaigns on these platforms so i do trust in them over my own intuition or gut feel on a situation and usually the final question i get is how many creatives should you have inside of each ad group so for me i usually do between three to five individual videos for each ad set so in this one we have pressure test and as you can see we have four videos paired with two ad copies and i believe that is the perfect combination so you have eight ad combinations right there and that is more than enough for each ad group to determine what is potentially a winner so now that you set up your test campaign this is where things get real and where people go off the rails and they're like a chicken with their head cut off because now they're spending money they're getting emotional they're getting way too tied into the performance of their campaign where they make decisions that are not rational so typically when i test a product i want to give it two days and if it doesn't show me enough life which means tons of add to carts a few purchases here and there i'm typically going to move on now in the first day i think you kind of have to be more patient with things most of the time you are not going to see purchases on the first day but that doesn't mean the product is bad I would say my best piece of media buying advice is you can't panic when things go wrong for a day or two. The worst media buyers are always the ones that check their analytics every hour or when they see at the end of the day that, oh, it didn't go my way. I was unprofitable. They panic. They turn things off. They start to test a bunch of new creatives and they don't really know why they're doing it. When, when we looked at the data over a three day set or the last seven days, you can clearly see they're still wildly profitable and things are still working, but they just overreacted because one day didn't go their way. And you're just gonna realize as an e-commerce entrepreneur with time, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, typically worst performing days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, usually are gonna be great days. And if you can win and be profitable on four, five, six days of the week, then you are crushing it. And if you learn to up budgets and maximize the momentum when you're having good days and minimize the losses and reduce budgets on days that you know aren't performing the best for you, that is when you will make the most amount of money. And that is how you become an elite media buyer. So I would say when you have campaigns that have been running for more than a week, don't make decisions day to day, make decisions based on at least a three day window. But if you're really being smart, do it based on the last seven days to get an accurate assessment of how your ad groups and your ads are actually performing versus, oh, they underperform for one day now. Therefore, I have to turn it off. So let me show you a quick example of one campaign right here. In the first day, I spent $100 and I did get two purchases. But even in this case, if I just got the five, six add to carts, I'd still feel comfortable in letting this run another day because that is life that shows me that there's interest in this product. It's not just clicks. There is clearly some buying intent. So add to carts definitely give you a good indication that there is something there. Now, when it comes to some scenarios, you may test a product and on the first day you spend $100 like this, you get 67 link clicks, which isn't terrible, but you get zero add to carts. Now, in cases like those, 
I do feel it is within your right to kill a campaign and analyze, is this a product that is worth retesting? Because I would not keep things running if I do not get an add to cart on that first day. I think there is something fundamentally wrong with either my website or my creatives. So when I look at these numbers, because I got 67 link clicks and we know about a five to 10% add to cart ratio is solid, I should have gotten at least three to four add to carts. So I got zero, which means my website and offer were not clicking. Now, when we go to my cost per unique link click, which is more metric on the ad side of things, we can see we're spending about two X more than we'd like. So since both of those things are completely off and I know at my level, I will build a website that can convert and I will build creators that I know will convert with the right product. I would move on in that scenario. However, let's say I hypothetically did get seven add to carts from these link clicks that would show me some life that would tell me okay let it run for another day see what happens and if we don't get purchases i would consider still retesting that product and the reason why is because i did see some life and when i break things down i'll probably say oh my cost per unique link click was really high so i'll test it one more time and in that next test i will have new creatives that get me cheaper link clicks and hopefully get people a little bit more into buying moods so some ads are better at pre-selling your audience better than others so if you have an ad that's super clickbaity sure you may get cheaper clicks but another ad that's more salesy may let's say get you 50 cents a link click compared to the clickbaity ad that gets you 10 cents a link click which is 5x cheaper but from people that do click that ad that is more clickbaity they may have a one percent conversion rate on your store compared to an ad that is more salesy that gives you a 10 percent conversion rate so at the end of the day this ad even though it's getting you more expensive clicks is getting you higher value clicks that actually get you a better return on your money so now let's talk about when you cut the fat on your ad groups because you're most likely going to be testing with multiple ad groups and out of those maybe one or two actually end up performing and getting purchases so when should you actually kill an ad group well for me personally that is all dependent on my break even on my product so if I'm selling this water bottle for $40 and it cost me 10, my break even is 30. So I usually will give as much leeway of the break even to each ad group to make a purchase. Meaning if I spend $30 and don't get a purchase, I'm killing that ad group. Now, my next rule is if I spend half of my break even, so in this case, $15 without an ad to cart, I'm killing it. And then my final rule is generally in no matter what the break even point is, if I spend $5 and I don't get an ad to cart, I don't get a purchase and I don't get at least three link clicks. I'm usually going to kill that ad group. So looking at this campaign right here, we can see the CBO optimized for the two top performing creatives, which is great. It did all the heavy lifting for us. We didn't waste really that much money at all because all these losing creatives barely got any spend. And that's why I love CBO. So what would be the next step of actually scaling things? Well, for me, what I love to do is I would isolate my winning creative. So when you're testing in this case, let's say, okay, we got 20 different ads. Well, only one really got all the spend and it was doing incredibly well as we can see right here this is well below our break even cpa and it got multiple purchases this is the big thing i will only start scaling with creatives that got me two plus purchases that were below my break even cpa so in this case we definitely have a winning ad and the best way to scale on facebook or tiktok is to isolate that creative into its own scaling campaign so let's say for instance this white background ad was absolutely killing it for me and we want to horizontally scale it up in its own scaling campaign well on facebook what you would do is you would click on that and you would duplicate it into a new campaign and i would label it whatever the name of the ad was so white background scaling campaign and what i tend to do is another cbo where i will start the budget at a hundred dollars two hundred dollars it's really up to you how much you want to play around with i tend to do two hundred dollars if you're more on a budget a hundred dollars is great and the only ad groups that will be inside this new campaign are the ones with that winning creative so the only ad that's being shown is just the winning creative. The whole purpose of this is to isolate your winning ad and put more spend into it so they can keep scaling. So as we can see in our new scaling campaign, we have one ad group. So I tend to actually duplicate the exact same ad group two times. So I'll have three versions of this ad group and there really is no difference. They are all identical to each other. But what will happen is that these creatives will hit different pockets of your audience because your audience is huge. It's millions of people. So how the algorithm works is it will show your ad to a specific pocket of those 50 million people, let's say in one ad group. And then the next ad group, although it is identical, it's going to show to a different pocket of those those 5 million it'll show to a specific few thousand of those and then the first one will show to a few thousand the next ad group will show to another group of a thousand and you'll see which one ends up optimizing the best even though they're all showing the exact same creative and when it comes to these scaling campaigns 
I am aggressive. It has to be profitable on the first day or I'm going to turn it off and then I'll just try it again tomorrow. It may not work the first time. It does happen where sometimes you have to do this exact method two times three times but if you get it to work just once then you are finding a way to consistently spend more money profitably on your store and you can always bump up the budget so when you do get this campaign to work i recommend vertically increasing the budget so if you're at 100 do budget increases of around 20 to 50 percent so i would bump it up from 100 to 150 then if it works again i do 150 to 225 so that's another 50 percent increase and i just keep on doing 50 percent increases as long as it keeps performing for me and i do that exact same thing with my current testing campaign so even in the original campaign you can start scaling it by vertically upping the budget if it's profitable put more money into it don't kill things because actually what i tend to notice is when someone has something that's working in the testing campaign and then they start to isolate it and start scaling in a new campaign they will kill the original campaign or the original creative inside the first campaign which makes zero sense if you have something that's profitable you nink and poop leave it on do not be the idiot that turns something off when it is profitable and i see that so often it seems so backwards to maybe you watching this video but it happens all the freaking time now, while that is the best method of scaling, usually the one roadblock people are gonna have is they get too over-reliant and frankly, lazy on their one winning ad. So you have this ad that's doing really well for you and then you just think you're gonna just piggyback that to the freaking moon and you're gonna deposit that all the way to the bank and then you're gonna buy your first house just right off of that one winning ad. Now, in some cases, you will have an ad where you can spend 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 dollars on it and it will still be profitable. Congratulations, you found a unicorn most winning ads usually you can only spend 10 to fifty thousand dollars on before they fatigue before the performance starts to dip so in order to prepare yourself for that you need to be testing more creatives so that way you have more winning ads and you're not over -reliant and you put all of your eggs in one basket because if you have one winning ad sure you could scale to a thousand dollars a day but once that ad starts to fatigue you're back to square one However, if you had five winning ads that you're scaling at the same time, where each ad has its own scaling campaign, you have a much, much more stable foundation and infrastructure, and you can scale to greater numbers. Cause you have one winning ad, you might be only able to scale to $1,000 a day. Compared to if you had five winning ads, you could probably scale to 10,000, 20,000, $30,000 days. So really the more winning ads you have, the more you can scale. It's as simple as that. So how do you test new creatives? Well, for me in my original testing campaign, what I will do is I will click or create a new ad group. And inside this new ad group, I'm going to drop all the new ads I've been working on. Now I do this in groups of four. So if I have four new videos, I want to test, I will have one ad group for that. If I have 12 new ads, I want to test, I will do three ad groups each with a set of four inside. So I can try to see which one gets some spend. And Facebook's going to determine that if these new creatives don't get any spend, they're not good enough. They're not better than your winners so you have to keep making and pumping new ads every single week so you can discover new winners and finally find ones that can beat your current winner so you can be even more profitable so how do you go about testing new creators which i know this is supposed to be a media buying video well real briefly what you should do is analyze your winning ad and then think of new hooks that you can do new second clips that you can do new things that you can do to the body whether that's adding a social proof clip a testimonial clip or shortening the ad or lengthening the ad so length is a big part changing the music changing the voiceover changing the call to action those would be the six main things that you can do to add new variations add new ads that you could be testing and find new winners that can scale even beyond your original winning Ad. Now, while that scaling method alone can easily help you scale to five, 10, 20 grand days like my top students inside of Bold Ecom, you do need to learn the other ways of scaling in general because as a media buyer, the best approach is to try everything and see what works. You don't know what works until you try. So I would say the other most popular ways of scaling is first off doing bid caps. Now with bid caps, by far the best strategy I've ever learned was from a guy named Jose Torres. This guy has scaled to million dollar months consistently with his clients and what he does is he will calculate his break-even point on a product. So again, let's say $30, and then he will do bids based on double that amount. So if he knows his break-even is 30, he will have a campaign with 10 ad groups, and he'll start the first ad group at a $60 bid. The next one will be at 61, then 62. So he does it in dollar increments, so he'll do 60 through $70, and those will be his first bids. So he actually starts with a higher bid so that way Facebook will prioritize your bid and your ad over other ads that have a much lower bid that probably won't really get any spend. Each one of the ad groups is gonna be identical 
except for that bid amount. So you're gonna do 60, 61, 62 in that specific case with your break even. Know what your break even is, multiply by two, that's your starting bid. It's as simple as that. Now, if you're wondering what should you do on the creative side, every single ad group from 60 to $70 bids will see the same set of ads. There's no difference there. So you're just going to plug in your winning ad. So if you have one winning ad, okay, that means one ad will be shown in each ad group. If you have three, put in all three. I tend to not go above five in that specific scenario. So same pretty much rules as the testing campaign. So if we go here, manual sales campaign, you're going to choose your objective event. So from here, we're not going to do catalog. We're just going to do CBO probably around in this case, once we're getting bids, I would recommend you can do a CBO of around 250. You can also do ABO. I have no problem with doing ABO and then setting a budget of $20 per bid. So you'll have 10 ad groups, $20 for each one. So $200 a day. So then from here, we're going to choose our pixel, do purchase event. And then of course, we're going to do our bid of $60 and we'll click on next. From there, obviously we're going to choose the creatives that we want to test. So we'll just set this up as an example and I'll show you the duplication process. Okay, so we got our call to action of shop now. So this is just a dummy campaign that I'm going to turn off. So let's click publish. And then from there, we're going to duplicate this ad group. So we got our winning ad in there, hypothetically. And if we go back to our ad sets, we are going to check this ad group. We are going to duplicate it nine times into the original campaign, just like that. And you can choose in your columns to have the total bid amount. So that way it's easier to adjust each one. So I'll just show you real quick what I mean by that. So we're going to go down here. We're going to go to customize our columns. In fact, we don't even have to customize the columns. So now that we have our nine copies from here, we're just going to edit each one and then we're going to adjust the bid amount for our cost caps. So we'll do 61 here. Next one we do 62. And once you figure out which bid is working the best for you, let's say in this case, it's $62. What you can do is do the exact same process where you know, all right, this is a winning audience creative combination. Let's isolate it, put it into its own scaling campaign of just $62. And we might have three, four, five different ad groups that are exactly the same with that bid. Now where Jose likes to go a little kind of crazy with it is he will do 10 cent increments. So once he finds what bid works, so let's say again, $62, the next step is he will create an all new campaign with just bids of $62, $62.10, $62.20. So in 10 cent increments, it'll find out what bid to the cent amount ends up being the right one for him. And again, if you want to go a layer deeper, this is like inception, not going to lie. You could do all right, $62.10 is the winning bid. All right, let's do 62.11, 62.12, 62.13 in a new campaign from there. And you are really getting into the weeds, but that is how you can discover new bids and new audiences that you can scale as well and do the exact same process of isolating it and then vertically scaling it up. And I'd say the final way you can scale once you've identified some winning creatives is to do sales and do an advantage plus shopping campaign. So from here, obviously Facebook controls all the targeting. You just throw in the winning creatives and let Facebook do its thing. So you can easily scale up one of these campaigns to a thousand, two thousand dollars by vertically scaling it up by 20 to 50%. I don't recommend vertically scaling ever above that amount because that's when things kind of get crazy and it gets a little bit unpredictable. And sometimes you can have a really, really good campaign that's been performing for you, but because you bumped the budget too aggressively, it tends to just set everything back to the learning level and the results end up being terrible. And I would say the most underrated way of scaling when you have a winning product is to scale it in new markets. Once you have something that's working most likely in either US or Canada, take it to Australia, take it to the UK, take it to certain European countries that also speak a lot of English and you will find new markets that with the same creatives, with the same website, you can easily start scaling to because it's an all new untapped audience that you hadn't previously showed your product and ads to. Now I'd say the final, final method of scaling, and this is really only specific to TikTok. I find if you do this method on Facebook, it does tend to crash and burn what you currently have running. And Facebook is the more scalable, consistent platform is surf scaling, which you should probably know about. But if you don't, it's basically the process of, okay, I'm checking my data and it's, let's say the first couple hours of the day, I wake up, it's 10 AM, my ads have been running and things are profitable. So it's basically when things are working and you're getting momentum, up the budget continually throughout the day. So let's say for instance, I have my campaign here and I'm looking at this ad group and let's just say hypothetically, it's 10 AM, it's been a thousand dollars and I can see here my break-in CPA is around, let's say $25. All right, we're at 11, we are crushing. So what I will do is I will edit the campaign budget or I'll edit that specific budget on that ad group if I'm on an ABO and I will bump it up, let's say by 50%. Then I'll take a look, let's say two, three hours later. And if 
let's say we bump the budget from a thousand to two thousand dollars it's still cooking we're still very profitable we'll bump the budget by another 50 percent or 100 percent and this is a very aggressive strategy bumping budgets up that frequently you're probably going to bump it up every two to three hours and you're just riding the wave riding the momentum so you may go from a thousand dollars a day when you first started to now you end the day at eight thousand dollars and what you typically will do is at the end of that day once it's around midnight you'll reset it back to a thousand dollars a day and you'll do that same process again so if you want a visual example of what that would look like let's say this was the campaign in question so as you can see daily budget's 50 dollars. so if it was cooking and doing really well i may bump it up to a hundred dollars and at that point throughout the day let's say it's halfway through the day it's not gonna have spent that full hundred dollars it'll probably have spent around 40 to 50 but if i notice hey i'm cooking i'm profitable i got multiple ad groups that are making purchases then let's bump up that budget again from a hundred dollars a few hours later now we're going to bump it up to two hundred dollars so this is where you would edit if it's a cbo and then if it's abo you're just edit at the ad group level and that's all you have to really do